Hey guys, so we're going to be jumping into the book of Obadiah today. Now, Obadiah is famous for being the shortest book in the Old Testament at only one chapter and 21 verses. But as we see, there will be more to it than just being a short book. It has a lot of words upon God's faithfulness to Israel as well as his judgment to Israel's enemies. Um, so with this, we see that Edom was the country or the nation that this judgment, this prophecy was against. Now this goes against most Old Testament prophecies because most deal with um, judgment against groups of nations or you know multiple nations, whereas this is one specific judgment just against the Edomites. Now, the question might be, who were the Edomites? The Edomites were the descendants of Isaac. So Isaac had two children, Jacob and Esau. Jacob, eventually his um, descendants became the people of Israel, whereas Esau's descendants eventually became the people of Edom. Now, Edom, early on from the very start, basically, was against the things of God. They consistently disobeyed God's commands and were constantly fighting against Israel. And we see this even in the beginning when it was just brother against brother that whenever um, Jacob took Esau's birthright by deception, at that point Esau wanted to kill Jacob. And it seems like that animosity between the two just continued to grow over the centuries. And we see that Edom was consistently a thorn in Israel's side. So there was a moment in time where Israel was trying to pass through Egypt in order to get to Canaan. And instead of the Edomites letting them, they refused to help them in their, in their journey. So after that, there was another several instances where they were at battle with one another, Israel versus Edom. And eventually, what would end up happening was whenever Israel was being ransacked by the Babylonians in 586 BC, um, Edom, instead of coming to the aid of Israel, actually did nothing and rejoiced over Israel's defeat and played a part, basically, by their doing nothing in Israel's um, takeover. So then... Uh, ironically or unironically, however you want to see it, Babylon, shortly after uh, taking over Israel, eventually defeated Edom as well. And Edom, basically, from that point forward, ceased to exist, and they were no longer known in the pages of history. So now we are going to go into the text of Obadiah, and we are going to see the first nine verses will deal with Edom's certain judgment, that their judgment is assured because God has laid it out as such. So it begins with this in verse 1, the vision of Obadiah. So this word vision is his own, and it is one of only three books to be called a hazon in the Bible, the other two being Isaiah and Nahum. And this is, you know, another word for vision that has been translated for it is revelation. So what this is saying is this is a revelation or a vision from God to the prophet Obadiah. So obviously the entire Bible is from God, but this is wanting to say at the outset that this judgment against Edom is God's words, not Obadiah's. So it goes on to say, this is what the Lord God has said about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy has been sent among the nations. Rise up and let us go to war against her. Look, I will make you insignificant among the nations. You will be deeply despised. Your arrogant heart has deceived you. You who live in clefts of the rock, in your home on the heights, who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even from there I will bring you down. This is the Lord's declaration. So Edom will find out that there is no lasting security apart from God. So Edom's capital was a city called Petra. And Petra was thought to be impregnable because it was built into the side of a solid rock cliff. And it was set within a canyon that could only be entered through a narrow gap. So the people of Edom, and specifically the people of Petra, thought that they were 
the most safe people that were in existence because of the location of their capital city, especially, they thought there was no way for an enemy army to be able to come in to where they were at and defeat them. So they were getting very proud in a bad way, thinking, you know, nobody can bring us down. We are unstoppable. And this is even what it says in verse 3. It says, Your arrogant heart has deceived you, you who live in clefts of the rock, in your home on the heights, who say to yourself, Who can bring me down to the ground? Though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even from there I will bring you down. This is the Lord's declaration. So Edom was on the southern border of Israel, and Petra, or another name for Petra was Sela, was considered to be unstoppable, and that it could not be conquered by an invading army. And this reminds me of the movie, as well as the real event with Titanic, which they said that it was an unsinkable ship. And then somebody else said that God himself could not sink that ship. And this should remind us of Proverbs 16, 18, which says, Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. So the people of Edom were very arrogant. They were very filled with pride, thinking that they could not be brought down. And this was a recipe for disaster, not only their wicked deeds, but then their wicked beliefs of um, pride and lack of any type of humility. So this city of Petra, or Sela, is considered one of the marvels of the ancient world. It's, it was considered such a, an amazing um, thing to behold, and they were taking their beliefs in their security, not in God, but in the location where they were at. And again, it even says in verse 3, Your arrogant heart has deceived you, you who live in clefts of the rock, in your home on the heights, who say to yourself, Who can bring me down to the ground? So they thought that they were out of reach from anybody and anything, and they would find out that that was not the case. So look at verse 4 again. It says, Though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even from there I will bring you down. This is the Lord's declaration. So what he's saying is here is that even from the place where you think you are most secure, even from there, I am able to reach you. So much like maybe an eagle could think that they are unable to be hurt up in their nest on top of a mountain or something, obviously God sees and is able to do what he wants even from up there. And these people, they thought that they were safe and secure, and they did not understand that God is able to execute judgment to anybody, anywhere. So their security was a false sense of security that they should not have had. And much like Satan, who was filled with pride and thought that he was uh, able to do whatever he pleased, he realized that he was just a creature and that he was not the creator, much like us, we need to understand that we are um, created beings by the creator. And this is why Jesus later, he said that he saw Satan fall like lightning. And, you know, all of us who are filled with pride, you know, pride does lead to destruction, maybe not immediately, but it always brings with it uh, judgment upon us. Continuing on to verse five, it says, if these came to you, if marauders by night how ravaged you would be. Wouldn't they steal only what they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, wouldn't they leave some grapes? How Esau will be pillaged, his hidden treasures searched out. Everyone who has a treaty with you will drive you to the border. Everyone at peace with you will deceive and conquer you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you. He will be unaware of it. And that day, this is the Lord's declaration, will I not eliminate the wise ones of Edom and those who understand from the hill country of Esau? Teman, your warriors will be terrified so that everyone from the hill country of Esau will be destroyed by slaughter. So we see here, as well as in a few of the previous verses, that the thing that Edom perceived as its strength would lead to its downfall. So they thought that they were safe in the city, but God would plummet them from the heights and bring judgment upon them and their city. So they took great pride in their wealth, but these thieves would come in and steal all that they had. And it talks about how grape pickers still leave some grapes on the vine and how 
you know, if somebody comes and breaks into your house, they're going to steal a few things. But in this case, God is saying that Edom will have everything taken away from it. There won't be anything left in the city and talking about how these things that you were holding in such high esteem, they're all going to go to another. Another area of perceived strength that would lead to its downfall was this assurance that they had in their allies. In verse 7, it says, Everyone who has a treaty with you will drive you to the border. Everyone at peace with you will deceive and conquer you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you. He will be unaware of it. So these people that they were taking such confidence in to help them out if they got into a bind, these were some of the same people who would eventually backstab them and turn on them and help uh, lead to Edom's eventual takedown. Now verse 10 begins a bit of a shift because in verse 10 it begins to mention to us some of the things that Edom had done to um, cause this judgment upon them. And so it lists in verses 10 through 14, Edom's sins against Judah. So here's what it says in verse 10. You will be covered with shame and destroyed forever because of violence done to your brother Jacob. So whenever it says to what you've done to Jacob, it's not just saying the person Jacob. This has to do with the nation of Jacob, which was Israel, how Edom went against uh, the Israelites and continued to disobey God. So with this, it says, you will be covered with shame and destroyed forever. So there aren't any Edomites around today, and that's because God has made a decree that he would judge them and that they would be destroyed forever. So then it says this, do not gloat over your brother in the day of his calamity. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction. Do not boastfully mock in the day of distress. Do not enter my people's city gate in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their misery in the day of their disaster, and do not appropriate their possessions in the day of their disaster. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off their fugitives, and do not hand over their survivors in the day of distress. So they were boasting, they were laughing of... Israel's destruction, they sat back and watched them get destroyed. Instead of helping, they, they let the Babylonians have their way with Israel, which was um, a grievous sin that they committed. So in verses 11 through 14, the dominant word is the word yom or day. And this is found 10 times in the Hebrew text. So it says, um, on the day that you did this or on the day that you did that, and it's pointing to a specific day, and this is pointing to the fact of when Babylon destroyed Israel. It's saying, on that day, you did this, Edom. On that day, you did that. But it's also got maybe a bit of a double meaning and pointing to the future day in the end with the day of the Lord, with the coming of God's judgment upon all um, people, that he will exercise just judgment to each person and each nation accordingly. And that's where we turn to now. Verses 15 through 21 deal with the judgment of the nations. So then verse 15 says, For the day of the Lord is near against all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. What you deserve will return on your own head. So this is a classic example of you reap what you sow, that you get in what you put out type of thing. And so the Edomites were overall a very wicked nation. Now, that doesn't mean that there might not have been somebody who fled Edom and turned to God, but overall they were a very wicked nation. And with this, we see that as they were dealing with others would be the same type of punishment that God would bring upon them. And this isn't just for them, it seems like. It says, for the day of the Lord is near against all the nations. And he's saying, I think, to all the nations, including Israel, as you have done, so it will be done to you. And this should be a reminder to the United States of America, to every nation today, that ultimately God is in control. Ultimately, how we treat others will return upon ourselves. It might not be immediate, but it will happen. So verse 16 says, As you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations will drink continually. 
They will drink and gulp down and be as though they had never been. So just as the nation staggered with drunkenness here from the win of victory as they celebrated the conquest of God's people, they will eventually stagger from the wine of God's judgment. And I want to read a few verses just to kind of show this parallel that right here they're in a sense drunk off of the victory defeating God's people that they will eventually be um, staggered with the wine of God's judgment. So here's what it says in Psalm 75 verse 8. For there is a cup in the Lord's hand full of wine blended with spices and he pours from it. All the wicked of the earth will drink draining it to the dregs. So he's saying here that this judgment that he's going to pour out, these wicked nations will drink from it and drink it to the dregs, drink it to the very bottom. Jeremiah 25, 17 says, So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me drink from it. And then finally, Revelation 14, 10 says, He will also drink the wine of God's wrath, which is poured full strength into the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb. So with this, we see that they will eventually no longer be laughing, but it will be a judgment where they will be, in a sense, drunk off the wrath of God, drinking that to the bottom. Verse 17, But there will be a deliverance on Mount Zion, and it will be holy. The house of Jacob will dispossess those who dispossessed them. So Israel will repossess the land from Edom. So what Edom played a part in defeating Israel, Israel repossesses that land from Edom eventually. Verse 18, Then the house of Jacob will be a blazing fire, and the house of Joseph a burning flame. But the house of Esau will be stubble. Jacob will set them on fire and consume Edom. Therefore, no survivor will remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. So God's basically saying here that Israel will be the flame and Edom will be the stubble being consumed by Israel. Now, to me, I see a bit of a parallel between verses 5 and uh, verses 18 where in verse 5, it speaks of all the possessions of Israel were taken from them by the um, people who would defeat them, which was the Babylonians. But here in verse 18, it says that there will be no survivor of Edom. So whereas maybe Israel was defeated from their physical possessions, Edom was defeated in their person completely. And then finally it says this, Saviors will ascend Mount Zion to rule over the hill country of Esau, but the kingdom will be the Lord's. So this is a good reminder for us today. The very last part of that verse where it says the kingdom will be the Lord's. God reigns and ultimately God will bring perfect justice. That's what verse 15 says. As you have done, it will be done to you. That God is a just God. That our God reigns. That he is in control. And that he will set everything right eventually. So on the day of the Lord's intervention here he will destroy all of his enemies, those that had constantly gone against him and never turned to a righteous standing. They will eventually be put in the dirt and never heard from again. God will deal with them completely. So the day of the Lord shows us two key things from the Bible. Number one, it shows us that God will judge those who do not submit to his lordship and in a New Testament sense, put their faith in Jesus Christ to forgive them of all of their sins and to cleanse them of all unrighteousness. So judgment is certain for those who reject the lordship of Jesus. But the second thing that is sure to come about by the day of the Lord is that God's kingdom will be established. And um, in a sense, we are in a already not yet um, placing where, yes, God reigns forever already, but in on that day, his um, kingdom will be established on earth as it is in heaven, and that will be a, a glorious time. So Edom is a great reminder for us that... Uh, we have to be on board with what God is on board with. We have to love what he loves. So often today, people want to go with what with whatever is most politically expedient or whatever will 
cause the least amount of friction among their congregants or whatever will get them the most likes on social media. And what we need instead are people with backbones, people that will declare truth even if it's unpopular. Because ultimately we have to go for the approval of God and not just man. And and that's what God will be pleased with is if we are trying to um, serve him in a faithful way. And we see that what happens for those people and nations that don't is judgment. But the good news is we can avoid that judgment by repenting of our sins and putting our faith in Christ alone. So I hope this um, quick summary of Obadiah was a blessing. And until next time, I'll see you then.